What is the word, Nutrition Heroes? Welcome to the next episode of the Nutrition Hero Podcast. I'm Dr. Brad Watts in the Podcast Lab, as always. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for spending a little attention with us today. So, I have a pile of stuff to get through today. We'll see how much I can get through in about 30 minutes. But, I want to give a quick commercial for the next episode that you're going to be hearing next week. We're going to have Mark Newman, the creator of the Dutch Test, is going to be on the podcast next week. And he has a very cool way of analyzing hormones. I want to make sure that we get a deep dive on a subject that I talked about a couple of weeks ago so that you can have some actionable information to show your patients what in the world is going on with them and then what in the world you're going to do about it. And so I'm excited about that. So any of you that are supporting patients that are going through uh, weight loss challenges, cancer, diabetes, Alzheimer's disease, MCI, Uh, thyroid conditions, autoimmune conditions, gut problems, anything that the endocrine system is uh, participating in. I want to make sure that you listen to this podcast because this is one that uh, I find this gentleman's information very valuable. And um, and anytime I do that, I want to make sure that I can uh, bring that information to you as well. So anyway, tune into that one. Mark Newman, I appreciate him spending a little attention with us. So that'll be good. A couple of things that I want to talk about here today from a news perspective. Um, One, I don't know if you heard this one, but Bayer and Monsanto are both joining forces as if they weren't already doing that, but they're merging. And uh, what's happening is is basically they're creating a lobbying arm that is going to be larger than many countries' uh, national GDP. And so what happens is, is they just have enough money to fight battles that nobody else does. Um, I want to highlight that because these battles are rarely fought in the form of public opinion. They're usually fought in the form of public policy. Um, So keep an eye out for that kind of stuff. All right. Next, um, we have a, hey, this this thing I've seen in the news a couple of times. And so I wanted to to make sure to highlight this. And really what's happening is, is the statement that says the elderly, right, as if they're one person, the elderly are taking too many vitamins too many supplements we're creating a toxicity and what happens is is all of the metals in those vitamins and by metals they mean minerals right not to be confused with the stuff that comes out of your teeth those fillings um i say that with a smile but they're saying these metals are creating like a magnet force for cancer cells and what happens is they all culminate together and create a petri dish for cancer i'm telling you right now the elderly is not a person, right? And so, like anything in healthcare, in my opinion, it has to be customized, so don't listen to that stuff, all right? Don't listen to that stuff if you hear that walk into your office and they say, well, my doctor told me not to take vitamins because they cause cancer. What in the world? Maybe your doctor needs to read, all right? So, um, anyway, throw that out there for you. Make sure that you are looking in on some of this stuff, Um very much so. Uh, Mercola's got a good opinion on that, actually. If you go on his website, May 27th is when his article was published. And um, it's the title of the video with the article underneath it is called The Myths of Dietary Supplementation. So take a peek at that, Dr. Mercola. Just go to mercola.com and find that one for yourself as well. Very cool. All right, today what I want to talk about for the most part is going to be uh, vitamin CoQ10 some applications there from a physiology perspective, things that you can do, even if you just buy it off the shelf, right? If you're of the genetic predisposition to be able to digest that stuff, uh, the value that it can bring you is phenomenal. And so we're gonna talk about that. But first, one more news article here. All right, so I don't know where this originally came from, but sulforaphane may prevent Alzheimer's is the, the title here. Let me find where that came from. Oh, there it is. National Institute on Aging Causes of Alzheimer's Disease. All right. So they're basically a med group that are looking at Alzheimer's disease the same way that uh, Pfizer, who, if you've been following any of the news, stepped out of the Alzheimer's industry uh, from a research perspective just this year in 2018, I believe, January. Uh, So anyway, what they're saying is sulforaphane, a chemical that you can find in green leafy vegetables, cruciferous vegetables, uh, rather, like broccoli, etc. They're saying that it can prevent Alzheimer's disease by removing those amyloid beta proteins. And so when you look at this amyloid placking that takes place in Alzheimer's disease, that has typically been 
the the hallmark in the mind of physicians and researchers for decades, right? If you ask Dr. Ruben Valdez, he's going to tell you 34 years, 34 years. And if you haven't had an opportunity, by the way, to listen to Dr. Ruben Valdez, um, chiropractor, talk about cognitive decline, get on that. All right. So I think I've had him on the episode on episodes here of the Nutrition Hero podcast in the past, but I think we're going to have to have him on again, uh, just as the research on this stuff is constantly unfolding. So anyway, sulforaphane may prevent Alzheimer's disease. What's interesting is they're saying that it attenuates the amyloid uh, buildup. Well, if you're listening to any of the stuff that uh, Dr. Ruben Valdez is synthesizing and expounding upon, he's going to tell you that the amyloid is actually a protective mechanism for the brain. And what happens is in the presence of whether it be a toxic illness or a trophic illness or whether it be a an issue, um, you know, from a heavy metal uh, situation, whatever it might be, right? Uh, an inflammatory problem. The brain will allow that amyloid beta to collect and essentially protect those neurons, right? It's a protection mechanism. And so um, one of the things that you're finding in the medical literature is that when you remove that amyloid beta, the patients are progressing from early stage cognitive dec- uh, decline situations into full-on late-stage Alzheimer's rather rapidly. Now, to me, that's interesting because we look, it's not about the disease, right? In functional medicine, clinical nutrition, uh, in chiropractic, and this is kind of, I just got to say this, this is kind of going away in chiropractic, right? Um, And I want to make sure that um, we don't have B.J. Palmer turning over in his grave at all, and so I want to highlight this, right? The thing is not the disease. That's not what we want to talk about necessarily. We want to talk about the body's response to disease, really, the response to stress. And, um, and I just want to make sure that we, we make that the prominent point of discussion in chiropractic, in functional medicine, in clinical nutrition, all of it, right? That is so important. And um, chiropractic world is getting so uh, dialed in on the chiropractic condition because that's what insurance pays for. The chiropractic condition is chronic disease, right? That's super important. So anyway, when we talk about these things, okay, we want to talk about why is that amyloid beta potentially, right? Why is it a protective mechanism? And if that's the case, what is sulforaphane doing to attenuate amyloid beta? Possibly supporting the body's ability to rid itself of some of the underlying mechanisms that are causing the brain to protect itself and downsize. That's the cool part, right? So it's not like, hey, take more sulforaphane, let's encapsulate encapsulate that, give it to a patient, and boom, there is the silver bullet that you're looking for for Alzheimer's disease, right? That's not what we're talking about. So I just want to highlight that. When you read research about this stuff, whether it be diabetes or Alzheimer's disease or thyroid dysfunction, whatever it is, right? We got to make sure we're looking at it in the right context. It's about your body and your body's ability to heal. That gift that you have inside of you that heals the edges of a cut together. Don't ever lose that focus. All right, I'm gonna step off that soapbox there for a minute, but anyway, um, let's talk about vitamin CoQ10 and how that supports your body's natural ability to heal. Right, so. CoQ10, who, what, where? Where is this stuff? What is it? And um, who needs it? Who uses it? What in the world is going on with this stuff? Okay. So, obviously, CoQ10, coenzyme Q10, is something that's ubiquitous in human tissue. It's everywhere. You're going to find it all over the place. Highest concentrations of this stuff are going to be in organs with high rates of metabolism. Well, what's that? Your heart, kidneys, liver. Okay. Primary action is as a cofactor in the electron transport chain. We're just gonna give you a little review and foundation so we can talk about action here in a second, okay? Um, Electron transport chain, that's super important and not to give you PTSD with physiology or anything like that from school, but the point is is that uh, what it does is it prevents generation of reactive oxygen species. Well, I call reactive oxygen species metabolic dust, okay? So your body takes in oxygen, you eat food, turns into glucose, and we mash the two together in a mitochondria. And um, so what happens is we produce energy, ATP energy, and then you exhale CO2. Well, one of the other um, exhausts of that oxidative uh, 
that oxidative reaction that happens there, that energy producing reaction, is called reactive oxygen species, that metabolic dust. And it accumulates. The more that it accumulates, it creates damage, not just of the membrane layer around a mitochondria, not just of a cell membrane, but oxidate. Think about it this way oxidation, oxidative stress is one of the things that leads uh, smokers to look more wrinkly, let's say, than. Um, you know, somebody who's a non-smoker. So if you have somebody in your life that went from uh, looking nice and healthy and fit from a skin perspective, tight skin, and now they look like a paper bag, um, and I, I don't say that to be mean, I'm just saying that to demonstrate the situation here, uh, and hopefully you guys get that. <laughs> uh, but if that happened, that's oxidative stress. That's what it looks like. That's what we want to avoid as you age. And so reactive oxygen species is the cause of that at the mitochondrial level okay so um, when we prevent reactive oxygen species from building up we're essentially preventing metabolic dust from accumulating right now when metabolic dust accumulates reactive oxygen species accumulates it decreases the coq10 content of the membrane of the mitochondria in the first place right what that leads to is decreased cellular respiration that means decreased energy production. That's big time, right? That's big time. So interesting how this works because what you're going to find is in the medical literature, um, you're going to find a lot of stuff that talks about the benefit of CoQ10 as it relates to those patients that are on dun, da, 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 statin medications. Statin medication. So there's some research back in the day highlighted by a gentleman the other day, Dr. Ron Grisanti out of the, uh, what is it, Functional Medicine University, uh, which they have a very good program, by the way. Functional Medicine University, Dr. Grisanti highlights this situation here. And his opinion is basically this. If a doctor knows that the statin medication situation is going to deplete a patient of CoQ10, right? That's an understood mechanism of a statin medication. It should be malpractice then for a doctor to not give the patient CoQ10 when they're giving them a statin. That's basically his position. Now in eight words, 10 words instead of, you know, five pages. But the point is, is that he's absolutely right. He's absolutely right. How in the world are you going to explain to your patient in common or layperson terms? You say, yeah, um, CoQ10 gets depleted, which means that you're going to age faster, which means that your body is going to shut down energy production, which means that your body is essentially going to develop a protective mechanism to um, basically keep cells alive. So whether it be insulin resistance, um, whether it be decreasing thyroid function, whether it be amyloid beta, right? If a doctor had to tell a patient that before they gave him a statin without giving them a CoQ10 situation to support it, nobody would ever take statins. That's the point. Oh my goodness. So anyway, I get animated about this because when you understand the background information on it and how, um, I can't remember what pharmaceutical company it was in the first place, but when they were bringing their statin medication to the marketplace, they were going to market it with a CoQ10 as well. Right, like the point was, is they were going to bring both of them, patent both of them at the same time, and it never got into the marketplace. But they knew the mechanism. Gosh, this drives me crazy. All right, so what I want to do though is I want to talk about CoQ10 from the perspective of cardiovascular mortality because that's where you're going to see the effect of this for most of your patients. It is my firm belief, and I think that if we synthesize some of the medical literature. Um, you know, to kind of support this position, which you can do with anything, by the way, take a position, there's going to be medical literature that backs it up, right? That's kind of one of the things that drives me nuts about uh, people that are constantly professing their, their uh, position in healthcare, right? Whether it be natural or pharmacological or whatever, right? One of the things that drives me nuts is when people just, they say something and then they find research that backs it up and it, it doesn't mean it's actionable, right? Like a lab rat is not the same as a person, okay? So I just, it's important to, to understand that perspective, right? So from, from that perspective with those conditions, when I say this, 
the cardiovascular mortality that is showing up in your patients that have metabolic conditions because of their lack of CoQ10, we can test this. We can test this. This is something you can look at on organic acid tests. This is something you can look at on uh, Dutch tests, looking at the oxidative stress values of patients. And it's not something that we have to be like, you know, imagining. It's not something that we go, oh, yeah, probably a good idea. From that perspective, here's what I want to talk about. In April 11th, 2018, here's a journal article, okay? Still reduced cardiovascular mortality 12 years after supplementation with selenium, which is a necessary cofactor in most enzymatic reactions in the body, and coenzyme Q10 for four years. Validation of previous 10-year follow-up results, prospective randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial in the elderly. There's that word again, elderly, as if they're all one person. So here's what happened, okay? They, uh, the people that were doing, the researchers gave this group of 400 and some odd uh, patients selenium and coenzyme Q10 for four years, right? Then they left them alone for 12 years. So they gave it to them for four years, stop, leave them alone for 12 years. So that's 16 years after the first day of supplementation. And they followed up with them to figure out what was the cardiovascular mortality rate, right? So, uh, and again, these are elderly people. Cardiovascular mortality rate of 28%, 28.1% in the active treatment group. So that was the people that took selenium and CoQ10 for four years and then stopped for 12 years. Versus a 38.7% in the placebo group, which means they didn't do anything for the full 16, right? So that is essentially a 10% uh, betterment or a 10% decrease rate of cardiovascular mortality. And these people weren't even using CoQ10 and selenium for 12 stinking years. What in the world? And this is like an afterthought for most physicians, especially when we talk about cardiovascular health. What in the world? So do you get that, right? They gave it to him for four years. And then they left them alone for 12. What would what would their have uh, their cardiovascular mortality of rate have been if they would have been supplementing that stuff for the four years and then continued for the next 12, right? Even if you just did a simple addition for each four years, let's say yields them 10%, which you know that's not going to be accurate. It's going to be exponential above that, right? You'd be looking at a 40% change. There's no way that that's going to be accurate, just stacking four years on four years, okay? But that's phenomenal, a 10% reduction versus the placebo group. That is very cool. Anyway, I get animated about this because this is so important for patients to be able to have something to latch on to where they can go, yeah, I'm making a difference, not just today, because it's not about today. It's not about the next six months. It's about living a quality of life that's worth living on down the road. It's about your patients being able to call you in a decade and be like, yeah, I'm doing great. You know what you taught me? I'm still doing it. That's what this is about, right? And so giving your patients something today, knowing that they're gonna get value out of it down the road, that, oh man, that's like, it's like legacy treatment is what it is, right? So if we, maybe we should coin that word, that, that term, legacy treatment. Do something today that's going to affect them for five or ten years down the road. I love it. I love it. Okay, so here's what the researchers concluded, though. <laughs> this makes me laugh, right? The mechanisms behind this effect remain to be fully elucidated, although various effects in cardiac function, oxidative stress, that's the one to highlight, fibrosis, and inflammation have previously been identified, right? So what they're saying is, is that well, we still don't know exactly the full ramifications of these methods and the methodology that we used, right? But looks like it could be promising. We should study this more. That's what I'm saying, right? That's what I'm saying. This is research that you can hang your hat on right now because what happens is, right, it takes 16 years for medical researchers to put something in as a standard of care and practice. How long ago were statin medications created? Gosh, how long ago, right? And here we are still talking about maybe CoQ10 is healthy for a patient, especially if they're on uh, statin medication protocol. Goodness, these people need to be on this stuff, right? This stuff is life-changing, life-changing. Now, when we look at why is it so life-changing, again, it is a vacuum. It's an antioxidant, but it is a vacuum 
for that metabolic dust. You're essentially decreasing the aging uh, at the cellular level, not even at the cellular level. You're decreasing the aging. Uh, if we could give it like a, a quotient, right? We could call it the, the aging quotient. You are decreasing that at the cellular apparatus level, at a mitochondrial level. That is phenomenal. That is so cool. And so when we look at this stuff, what we want to do is we want to talk about some of the other benefits. Kills triglycerides. we got research on that. The effects of coenzyme Q10 supplementation on lipid profiles among patients with metabolic disease. Oh, my goodness. All right? What they found is, is that, uh, where is it here? Coenzyme Q10 supplementation significantly reduced serum triglyceride levels and help improve lipid profiles. No kidding. What's it doing? It's decreasing inflammation. It is a vacuum for that metabolic dust. Okay? Um, really cool. How about heart energetics? Myocardial energetic-based therapeutics are groundbreaking in that they utilize novel mechanisms of action to improve heart failure symptoms without causing the adverse neurohormonal side effects associated with the current guideline-based therapies. This is from my myocardial energetics. So that's heart failure patients. Your patients that are dealing with like congestive heart failure, stuff like that, where they're getting really puffy legs and pitting edema. Oh my goodness. What they're saying is here, in quotes, these researchers, right? Um, what, <laughs> again, novel mechanisms of action, right? Meaning, this is newly thought out, right? As of 2018, April 30th. This is new to us. It's coenzyme Q10. Gosh. All right. Again, this is super important. Neurohormonal side effects are not caused by coenzyme Q10. However, they are by the medications that are utilized for heart failure. Could it be that heart failure down-regulating the cardiac output, therefore down-regulating the oxygen delivery, nutrient delivery, and the metabolism, all of that is a protection mechanism? Potentially. Something to think about, right? Epilepsy and cognitive decline applications for, uh, for that, obviously, with CoQ10. You got to like that, right? Neuroprotective mechanism of CoQ10 uh, against uh, induced kindling and associated cognitive dysfunction possible role of micro, microglia inhibition right what they're saying is microglia right so like the vacuum for neurons in the brain like a micro, macrophage um, if it's down regulating those and down regulating cell death coenzyme q10 how is it doing that it's a very strong antioxidant vacuuming up that metabolic dust okay literally this is all about that electron transport chain so cool all right, some effects on Parkinson's as well, autism spectrum disorders, migraines, right? If you're listening to this right now um, and you have migraines, right? Like I'm, there's a dude in California I'm thinking of specifically. If you're listening to this right now, I'm talking to you, man. If you got migraines, consider coenzyme Q10. It's a vacuum for that inflammatory buildup that happens, right? Awesome. Uh, man, we also have some potential support mechanisms here for glaucoma, cataracts, retinopathy, uh, degeneration from an eye perspective, nephropathy, your patients that have uh, nephropathy, okay, your chronic kidney disease patients. This one gets me, repeat pregnancy loss, right? This one's kind of touched me personally as well. Um, and when we look at repeat pregnancy loss, this is something that I want to make sure people understand, right? Coenzyme Q10 can be a regulator in Th1, Th2 paradigm, uh, you know, basically function, if I can give it a word, for females that have recurrent pregnancy loss, for a lack of a better word, idiopathic pregnancy loss, right? They don't know what's causing it. So coenzyme Q10 is shown to cause significant decrease in the Th1 mechanism as compared to the untreated group in this research study, right? That one's from 2015, so that's a while ago. How about this? If you're a gentleman that has decreased uh, sperm production, right, and decreased sperm motility, Coenzyme Q10 also showing signs of positive effect there, right? That is so cool. That one's from 2018, March 16th. So cool, right? Why is this even happening? All the things that I talked about, why is this happening? Because mitochondria deteriorate with stress. That is it right there. That is the name of the game. Mitochondria, your energy production sites, the engine of your body. You have billions and billions of these things. Like, some of the literature says that 20% of your body weight is actually made up of mitochondria. Those things deteriorate with chronic stress, right? They just do. That's just the name of the game. 
Okay, coenzyme Q10 is a vacuum for free radical damage. It is like the <laughs> it is like the Hoover, all right, of supplements. I'm just saying. <laughs> so what we want to do is we want to have a balance between energy production and reactive oxygen species production, between ATP and that metabolic dust. We want to have relative balance, and when your teeter totter is out of balance, like there's more reactive oxygen species than ATP, you're in trouble, man. You're in trouble. Bioavailability is key. So with coenzyme Q10, we got a couple of forms of it, right? Uh, ubiquinol which would be the active version of it and the less absorbable version of it for some people from a genetic perspective. And ubiquinone, which would be the inactive version or the less active version and um, the one that is more genetically uh, available, if we can put it in those terms. Okay. So when we talk about bioavailability, just put it in a liposome. That's the goal. Okay. So if you can see through the liposome, that means it's small enough, like the liquid, if you can see through that liquid, with the liposome in it, you know it's small enough to do its job. Okay, there are a couple of companies out of the marketplace that do a good job with that right now, and um, so from that perspective, we want to have the ability to see through the liquid. That is key. If you can't see through it, it means that the liposome is too large to create that bioavailability that you're looking for. Okay, so um, again, that's just a, a quick refresher on liposome size. SUV, small unilamellar vesicle, 20 to 100 nanometers. Large unilamellar vesicle. LUV is the middle range. That's 100 to 300. Multilamellar means there's many different layers, and it's 300 to 5,000. The differences between these things are drastic. We want the SUV, the small unilamellar vesicle. You can see through it. If we can give them a size a thing for you to grade it on, it's like a Skittle, okay? A Skittle. The SUV is like a Skittle. The LUV is like an exercise ball. Okay, and the MLV is like a Buick. You don't want the Buick and you don't want the exercise ball. They are too large to passively diffuse across the membranes of your mouth, the mucosal layers of your gut. Super important here, people. All right, you got to be able to see through that. Super important. So we talk about coenzyme Q10. If you're going to take it in this most absorbable form, so we talk about ubiquinol, then do that, all right? If you can't take ubiquinol or you don't want to mess around with the absorbability issues, just take it in a liposome. So that's the key. All right, so I kind of got on a, uh, a rant there, but the point is I hope you guys understand that ubiquinol, coenzyme Q10, plus some of the selenium support, etc., turns out to be a massive vacuum for free radical damage. It is a metabolic vacuum for that metabolic dust. You got to take it, all right? It's something that everybody needs to be on. So, all right. Um, I call it my secret mechanism, by the way, and it's a secret mechanism because even though it's in the medical literature, nobody nobody is talking about it with uh, the same veracity that they're talking about things like, you should really drink water. Yeah, you should drink water, right? It's important. Same thing with coenzyme Q10. It's just as important as drinking water. All right. Tune in next time to listen to Mark Newman on the Dutch podcast. He'll probably give us some tips on how you can assess your oxidative stress load, right, for those of you that are wondering, is this me? We can talk about coenzyme Q10 a little bit more maybe. Anyway, um, shoot me any questions if you want. If you got any uh, questions about the podcast, check out my Facebook page, Brad DC. Brad DC on my Facebook page. And um, get a little information coming out there probably uh, more often than once a week, like the podcast here. And so we can go from there. Thank you guys for supporting the podcast. You've been listening to the Nutrition Hero Podcast. Remember, the podcast is the only podcast that you're going to find on iTunes, YouTube, that's going to support both the science and the art of functional medicine, clinical nutrition, and the Nutrition Hero Podcast. That moniker is not about me. It's about you, the nutrition heroes that are serving their patients in their communities around the country. Good job. Keep doing it. We need more of you. All right. Blessings, everybody.